Hello, everyone. Welcome to Our Community, Our Health. This is a town hall series devoted to bringing researchers and the community together to facilitate conversation. Today's event, we will focus on the ongoings of organ donation. And we have a fantastic panel here today that will go into detail about what it is about organ procurement organizations. Our panelists will also go into what it's like to coordinate organ recovery and the importance of increasing donors. Throughout this journey, we will provide resources for you and address any questions that you might have. Now, my name is Tomas Arbasto. I'm the moderator for today. A little bit about myself. I will be graduating next week from the University of Florida with a Bachelor's of Science in Health Education. I was an intern for LifeQuest and had a fantastic time here. And I'm very excited about what they have to say and what they will share with you. So with that being said, feel free to type any questions that you have either during our conversation or after we will also have a Q&A. Without further ado, I will pass it off to each one of our panelists for a short introduction. Hi there, my name is Danielle Balvis. I'm the Executive Director of LifeQuest Organ Recovery Services. My name is Kathleen Geary. I'm the Director of Donor Program Development at LifeQuest. My name is Craig Martin, and I'm one of the uh, organ procurement coordinators with LifeQuest. All right, and so it looks like Shumi was having a little bit of technical difficulties, but we'll get back to her. And with further ado, I would like to start off the conversation with Danielle. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Thank you, Tomas. And um, thank you, Health Street, for inviting us to speak on what we think is a very important topic, and that topic is organ donation. So thank you for joining us. And um, as, as Tomas indicated and introduced us, um, I am the executive director, and I have been for the past 19 years, and I have been at LifeQuest for 27 um, and I'm going to provide you with kind of a, just a five minute overview on what an OPO or an organ procurement organization is, and it's the other speakers that will provide you with great detail on some of our primary responsibilities. So what is an OPO? Well, we are a federally designated non for profit organization that serves hospitals and transplant centers and our community, and that's what we're doing today. Um, and that goes across the board for every organ procurement organization in the country. We all do the same thing, um, only we have this federally designated territory or area. So this is ours and this is yours. If you live in any one of these counties, we are your organ procurement organization and we are LifeQuest. So please feel free to, to favorite that um, in, on your computer and call us anytime you have any questions regarding organ donation. But these are the counties we serve. There are 36 of them. And there are approximately 73 hospitals within these counties that we serve and three transplant programs. There's a multi-organ transplant program right here in Gainesville, and that is UF Health. And there's another multi-organ transplant program in Jacksonville, that's the Mayo Clinic. And then all the way out there in Escambia, there's Sacred Heart Hospital, that is um, a kidney transplant program. So we serve everything and anything related to organ donation for our communities within these counties, our hospitals, and our transplant programs. This is what the country looks like. There are 57 organ procurement organizations, and we are just one of them in Florida. But as you can see, Florida has four, and California has four, and New York has four. And why is that? Because a long time ago when Medicare, which is the body that federally designates our catchment area, when Medicare decided to divide out the country in terms of who will be the OPO for that area, they tried to keep population in mind and they tried to keep geography in mind. So if you were going to have vast geography like Washington and Montana, there can't be a, a tremendous amount of population. So we try to um, they tried to equal it out. And then at the end of the day, there were a lot of mergers. And so it's not as exactly as equal as it used to be. But there you are um, up in Northern Florida. And um, just wanna go over, just this is my last slide. I just wanna go over several of our responsibilities, our primary responsibilities, we have many, but one of the most important ones is referral response. So those 70 hospitals I was talking about, um, 
they're very separate from we from us over here at LifeQuest. The purpose of that separation and that really, really clear definition of what they do and what we do is because they're there to save the life. They're there to take care of that patient who's been in a, a motor vehicle accident or take care of that patient who's had a stroke. Their job is to try their best to save a life. And if it doesn't happen, because it doesn't always happen, um, then they call us um, because it's the, the care at that point is futile and the death is imminent and they make the referral to LifeQuest. So our, our job is to respond to those referrals in a timely manner. And again, some of our speakers will talk to you a little bit in more detail about that referral response, um, but that is something that we do with every imminent death that is referred in our area. When we get there, we evaluate medical suitability and we, we gather a lot of information before speaking with the family about organ donation options. It's important for us to gather as much information as we can because we never wanna offer a family the option of organ donation if one doesn't exist. So if the patient has metastatic cancer or something like that, um, we certainly don't want to tell a family they can donate organs. So we try to gather as much information as possible. One of the things we really need to gather is to know whether or not the patient joined the state donor registry. So that way the family conversation is more of an informational conversation rather than a permission seeking conversation. So again, more on that from Sumi, if she's able to join us, if, if not, we'll come back to me and I can explain that a little bit further. Uh, equitable allocation of organs is, is extraordinarily important. And, um, and our, our nation has the best organ donation and transplantation system in the world. Um, it, it all starts with the national database. That database houses every recipient who is waiting for an organ in our country. It also is the system where we input donor information. So if we have donor information, if we have an organ donor who has consented and we're pursuing organ donation in one of these 70 hospitals, we put the information in and, it, and that system generates a match run to tell us which patients in the country come up first that match that organ donor. Again, Craig will probably talk about this a little bit more, but the, the system is designed not to be biased for, for gender, for age, for race. It is the most equitable system in the world. And, um, and, and, it's, and it's, you should be proud to, to be in this country where organ transplantation is highly regulated and monitored. And, um, and most of the time, the matching has to do with your blood match, your blood type and your, and your size. So recovery of organs is something um, obviously we have to coordinate and packaging and, and, and labeling and transportation of these precious gifts is a high priority for us to make sure that they arrive at their destination safely. And we provide family follow-up. Another very important service of ours is to follow up with our families, maintain a relationship with our families and provide them information um, about their loved one and, and which organs could be donated. Um, so that's just a really brief overview of what an OPO is, what we do, um, a few of our primary responsibilities. But uh, for more specifics now, I will turn it back over to Tomas so he can introduce our next speaker. But thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, the next panelist that we'll be discussing today is Kathleen. So take it away whenever you're ready. Thanks, Tomas. I'm Kathy Geary. I'm our Director of Donor Program Development. And what I'm going to cover for you are the different kinds of outreach we have in the community from professional and public education to our volunteer program and the follow-up that we have with our, our donor families, our aftercare. So um, over the years, our primary audience for public education has always been high school students. In the last 20 years, we've spoken to more than 250,000 students from Escambia to Duval County. You saw Danielle's map of how large our territory is. One of the reasons we selected high school students as a primary audience is because at that 15, 16 year age, that's when they're going in to get their learner permit um, or their driver's license for the first time. One of the questions they're going to be asked is if they'd like to join the organ donor registry. It's their first big question they get to answer kind of as an adult on their own. And we wanna be sure that they have information on donation, whether they join the registry or not is completely up to them. But if the only thing they know about organ donations from what they might have heard on a television show, we want to be sure that they have the real story, all the information about what it is, how it works, what an organ donor can do to save the life of somebody else. 
over the years, we've always done our pre uh, presentations in the classroom. Last year was a little strange. We couldn't get in, so we switched to a Zoom model. We hope to get back in the classrooms in the fall. But on average, we hit about 30,000 students a year. So that's a, a great audience for us. We also do a lot of civic outreach. We talk to any civic club that will give us an invitation or if we make a cold call that they'll let us come in. Um, it's things like Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs. We'll go on the college campuses and speak to sororities and fraternities. We've got events going on at UF this week with SODA, the Students for Organ Donation Awareness, who are doing events for Donate Life Month, April's National Donate Life Month. And that's when we increase our presence in the community and in the hospitals, in the schools, um, anything to promote organ and tissue donation. Um, we work with houses of worship quite a bit too. Any denomination, any church, temple, mosque that wants to have a presentation or again, that responds to our inquiry, we'll go and, and talk about donation in that community. A lot of people think that uh, donations against their religion when most, if not all, Eastern and Western religions either fully embrace donation as an act of kindness, the ultimate act of kindness we can show to our fellow man, or leave it up to the individual to make a decision. So by speaking in congregations, and there's often people right in that, in that congregation who have had transplants, who need transplants, or who might be a member of a donor family, and we invite them to share their testimony with us. Um, we also do a lot of professional education in the hospitals. On Daniel's slide, she mentioned that within our service area, there's more than 70 hospitals, and most of them have potential for organ donation. They've got intensive care units, they've got operating rooms, they have ventilators. So these are the hospitals that we focus on, and we have a team of coordinators who will go in and do presentations to the intensive care nurses. They'll go into new employee, new nursing orientation classes. They'll speak to the respiratory therapists who maintain the ventilators in the hospital for patients. They'll speak to physicians, new residents and attending physicians and talk about the process so that everything from the referral right through the recovery, and you'll hear a lot more about that in a few, um, so that they understand the process and they become our internal champions in the hospital and they make the program successful. Our hospital services coordinators also are um, our data gurus. They collect all the data on each of those hospitals programs. How many referrals came in in a month? How many donors were there? How many organs were transplanted from those donors? Were there any process vari uh, variances that we need to follow up on so that we don't start sliding and have missed referrals, patients who could have been suitable candidates for donation, but they never call up. We wanna be sure that we don't have things like that happening. So they provide these reports back to the hospital every month. They set up collaborative teams in the hospitals called donor councils, multidisciplinary teams that have all different departments there to talk about how to make that program successful in that hospital. After somebody is a donor, we have a very, very robust aftercare outreach program. We will stay in touch with each one of our donor families for at least a year. We send different kinds of bereavement resources to them, um, helping them with their particular kind of loss. If they lost a child or a parent, or if they have children who've lost a sibling, um, whether it was by suicide or another manner, so that they have the appropriate kind of resources they need to help them on their own grief journey. We um, invite families to participate in a quilt project that we have where they can make a quilt square in memory of their loved one. We have them all over our office. They're beautiful. We take them out to different events so people can see a little bit about the life of this donor and what were these individuals like. If families want to stay in touch with us, with many, many do, we will stay in touch with them. They'll be part of the LifeQuest family for years. Um, they become our volunteer ambassadors. They go out and speak on our behalf. They're the ones who attend health fairs with us and they share their story because when you hear a donor family telling their experience with donation and how it became their loved one's legacy that he or she was able to save the lives of five other people through their gifts, that really resonates with people. That's the best story that, that you can hear about donations from someone who walked that walk. Um, not every family wants to stay involved with us and become a volunteer ambassador, and that's fine too. We're not going to we're not going to strong arm them and say you you have to be involved. 
Um, but a lot of times the recipients of these organs and the donor families want to write to each other. And that's a wonderful process. It starts out anonymously. And then as families say, well, you know, I'd really like to meet you or know more about you. We help put them together. Each year, we probably have about 10 to 12 families that make that direct connection. Some become bonded really quickly, become good friends, celebrate holidays together, go to Disney together. And it's really wonderful that together they're living the legacy of their loved one. Um, I mentioned our volunteer program. Most of our volunteers, we call them ambassadors, and most of them are either donor families or transplant recipients. Sometimes they're caregivers of recipients. And then every once in a while, they're just somebody in the community who believes in donation and wants to help us share the mission. They might, have not, might not have a personal connection to donation at all, but we invite them in and give them our, our training. And then they're the ones who are going out and are at these health fairs. I, uh, there's a health street health fair on the 10th of April on, on Archer Road, and we had our volunteer recipients man that station for us and share information with the, those in the community who came out. Wonderful opportunity. They really love to get involved that way. And some will go on to be media spokespeople. If we have a, a television station in Tallahassee that wants to talk to a donor family, boom, we've got a list of individuals in the community who are recipients or donor families who love doing this, and they're, they're very well-spoken and they can go on and share their story. Um, we also have uh, robust social media platforms. You can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, on our YouTube channel or on LinkedIn. If you go to our YouTube channel and it's just, you know, get onto YouTube and it's LifeQuest, we have a, a, a library of videos, probably 50 or more of, most of them are donor family testimonials. Some are recipients, some are even patients who've been waiting for transplants. But you see these stories and it's, it's in their own words what donation and what that experience meant to them. And you'll get a little bit better idea of what donation means or follow us on Facebook. We put up testimonials, not only from recipients and donor families in our service area, but other stories around the country that are pertinent and just heartwarming. Um, and that's a little bit more about um, the kind of education that we do both within the hospital and in the community. And now I'm going to turn it back to Tomas, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh, next speaker, our third of our fourth panelists, is Sumi. Sumi, if you may, just give a brief introduction about yourself before you speak. Thank you so much, and go ahead. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, this is I'm Sumi, and I'm a family advocate here in Jacksonville. Um, I basically, uh, my primary role is uh, to respond to any of the referrals that we receive from um, all the all these hospitals in Jacksonville. We have, like Daniel said, more than 70 hospitals uh, in our service area. But uh, as a family advocate here in Jacksonville, we respond to all the hospitals that we uh, that are there in the Jacksonville area. Then I also introduce organ donation to the families. To talk a little bit about this process, uh, it is the hospitals who make that initial referral to us uh, uh, and they do it to LifeQuest. And once we receive those referrals, um, they, they basically have to make the reference whenever a patient meets uh, our criteria, though that is uh, whenever a patient has any kind of severe neurological injury. And we are talking about these with the, um, a stroke, an aneurysm, or, or if the patient has had any kind of blunt traumatic injury through uh, a car accident, a gunshot wound, it could be an overdose as well. Uh, in those circumstances, there are other clinical criteria when they, when that is met, they are referred to us, and our role is to evaluate on those calls. So we receive close to six thousand of these referral calls um, in a year, and most of them are um, are screened out or ruled out at uh, at the um, at the time. Um, but let's say if they they do meet our criteria, then we would go into the hospital and do a quick 
uh, you know, like we will do a quick assessment or, and the chart review of the patient. In, in that scenario, up until now, the medical team is uh, very much involved in taking care of that patient. They are, uh, they are that is their primary role to make sure that this patient uh, survives the injury. And LifeQuest, we are very much in the background. We are just doing the chart assessments and making sure that the patient does meet our criteria. Uh, it is actually very rare and unique to end up being an organ donor. So we do have to do a thorough assessment to make sure that all our clinical criteria are met. Um, in the event uh, that the person succumbs to their injury and uh, they do not make it, um, the doctors would declare them brain dead or they or they have had that conversation with that family where they have uh, just given them a very grave prognosis and the family has made that difficult decision to, to actually go ahead and uh, stop any um, medical measures to life-saving measures for that patient. In that scenario, um, the timing is very critical uh, between that decision to uh, either compassion mean or the the news that their loved one has been declared brain dead and the time uh, before they are before the patient is taken off that vent we have to go in and speak to the family and present this opportunity of organ donation to them um, so the the family is it is a very sensitive time and the family is reeling from all this news uh, that they have gotten and we go ahead and uh, we do support them through this crisis. We try to make sure that they understand uh, the medical prognosis that has just been shared and through support and uh, through that, we also bring up the topic of organ donation to them. And in that conversation, we will of course check if the patient is a registered donor if um, if they are a registered donor, we we do share that news with the family, and quite often it makes it easier for the family uh, to arrive at a decision. And um, they are very much relieved to know that the patient uh, themselves have made that decision to um, be an organ donor, and it takes off a lot of burden from them. Uh, but we do also go in and speak to all. Um, all the patients basically who meet our criteria and we will be talking to the family. At this time, along with support, we will explain to them what the organ donation process looks like and we um, see if they would consent. If they consent to organ donation, then uh, there's just like a, a quick paperwork that we do. And we also do a medical social questionnaire, which is very similar to a questionnaire that you would get when you're donating blood. Uh, so after this brief paperwork and uh, the medical social questionnaire is done, we start this process of the patient becoming an organ donor at that hospital. So it is, um, and uh, I'll have Craig, would talk more about how that process looks. So if, uh, Tomas, I'll hand it over to you to introduce. Thank you so much, Sumi. Uh, without further ado, Craig, take it away, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Tomas. So yes, I, I will uh, cover the donation process from medical management to organ placement. So once we have authorization, which Sumi uh, spoke about, um, or consent for donation, we'll begin the process of medically testing to determine which of these donors' organs can be recovered for life-saving transplant. And if the donor has any viruses, infections, or other conditions that could prevent him or her from becoming a donor. So uh, once we get on site and we have spoken to the family, uh, we have uh, quite a few tests to be done in the beginning. Uh, we'll first send out blood serologies, uh, which will let us know what antibodies uh, the donor 
uh, or um, what antibodies the donor has or what we need to be aware of. We'll also send out blood like urine and, and sputum to the microbiology uh, for any of those results to come back positive. We shall notify the transplant teams of any positive cultures. Uh, we'll also do tests like echo, which echocardiogram uh, to see the function of the heart. Uh, we'll do a bronchoscopy to look at the lungs and if needed, clean out any secretions that are concerning. Uh, we'll also get a CT, which is a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to evaluate and try to rule out anything that might be of concern uh, with any of the organs. While we wait for serologies to return, we gather information uh, that will all be uploaded to a national database. Information uh, from labs like your sodium, potassium, creatinine, any liver function numbers. We also need to know these uh, different lab numbers so we can maintain the patient and keep the patient stable for transplant. Uh, we also need to know the patient's uh, blood type, height and weight so we can match uh, the donor to the right recipient. Once everything is uploaded, we can now generate uh, our organ lists. All of this is done so we can give the best uh, possible evaluation of all organs so that the transplant centers and the surgeons can make their own evaluation and to determine the best decision uh, for the recipients that they have on their list. So the, the database that we have uploaded everything to is an organization called UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing. This uh, computer matching system, uh, it, it does not look at factors such as um, the person is famous or wealthy. Uh, from the recipient side, the important factors are how sick that patient is and how long they have been on the waiting list. Detected at the front door. I apologize about that. Uh, from the donor side, it is how many lives uh, this person can save. When UNOS has matched up this donor with the patients in uh, need of the organ, uh, sorry, when UNOS has uh, matched up this donor with a patient in need of the organ transplants, uh, the database generates a list for us of all the patients who are matches. And then we start contacting those transplant centers to let them know we have, whether it's a heart, liver, kidneys, lung or pancreas uh, for their patient or recipient. While this process is going on and we continue to look for recipients, we're either taking care of the donor directly, if the patient is a brain dead donor, uh, to where we can write all the orders and medically manage the patient ourselves, or working with the attending physicians on the medical management of the donor, if we're pursuing as a DCD, which is donation after circulatory death. Uh, we have established some really strong relationships with all kinds of physicians and medical staff, so all the different hospitals that we work with. Also, during uh, the allocation process um, of the organs, the transplant centers will usually want more diagnostic tests and sometimes repeat tests done, such as like the CAT scans, uh, x-rays, and sometimes if they, if they will get another echo, but also one uh, heart cath. Uh, also, they may ask for a biopsy to be done, and sometimes we can't always get that done at bedside, but we can always get a biopsy down in the OR. And all this is done to get a better idea uh, if that organ is going to be the right one for their patient or recipient who is usually very sick. When all organs are matched or placed with these transplant centers, we'll work with the hospital's operating room and team to schedule our recovery operations. Once everyone is in agreement to know our time, all of those transplant teams um, come to the hospital where the donor is. And this takes up this takes some coordination. Teams can be flying in from all over the nation and we will set up transport to pick them up from the airport and take them to the hospital. And if needed, uh, we'll get an ambulance to take them back from the hospital to the airport uh, after the OR is complete. So in the OR, the recoveries always begin with thoracic or organs, which are heart and lungs. If they're, able, if they're able to be donated. And then abdominal organs, which are the liver, kidneys, pancreas, and intestines. If the donor is also going to donate tissue like skin, bone, cornea, that will happen after organ recovery. 
many times we'll have what we call an honor walk before we go down to the OR. Um, that is when the hospital staff and family and friends line the corner, uh, corridor from the donor's room to the ICU, from the ICU uh, to the elevator or to wherever the doors end. Uh, and they will give a very uh, reverent farewell to this individual as he or she makes his final journey to saving lives. And as uh, Kathy mentioned, we actually on the YouTube channel, we do have a lot of those on a walks that you're uh, free to uh, watch. Uh, so after the donation, we will let our families which or know which organs uh, were able to be recovered. And also, as Kathy mentioned earlier, we'll stay in touch with our donor families uh, for as long as they want to be involved with our program. And uh, I hope that was enough to give you some information. Um, and I'm going to pass this back to Thomas. Yes, thank you so much, Craig. I actually had a question. Do the donor families know where the organs, who is receiving the organs? I'll go ahead and answer that, Tomas. It's a great question. Um, after the donation, we will give the family very little anonymous information about the, the outcome of the recovery. We'll let them know which organs were able to be recovered and transplanted and a little bit of information about the recipient. For example, the heart went to a 13 year old girl who was transplanted in the Southeast. We don't give last names, we don't give hospitals, we don't even say the state specifically, but just to give them a little bit of an idea, did their loved one help children or um, adults and how many organs were recovered? Um, and as families and donors, and as families and recipients start to communicate with each other, then they can share all the kind of information they want about their loved one or about themselves. It's still anonymous, so no last names, no Facebook links, um, not the hospital where their loved one was treated or where they got their transplant. It stays anonymous until, again, we're seeing that these people are expressing an interest in meeting each other, and that's our sign that we need to remove ourselves from this anonymous exchange and put these people together to have a, a more personal relationship. And the, so many of our families do write at least one letter to the recipients. And we encourage all the transplant centers in our area to have their recipients write back to the family. We even make it a little bit easy for them by giving them packets to give to their recipients that have generic cards in there. If a recipient doesn't know how to start that letter, um, sometimes they'll feel guilty. Well, I'm alive and your loved one isn't here anymore. How do I possibly say thank you to this family? We have cards that, that express a sentiment and they can just sign it from John, you know, your loved one's liver recipient or something, but to get that process started. Perfect, thank you so much. I think there was a question in the Q&A that Danielle wanted to answer. I had, I clicked the wrong button, so I answered oh. it in type. I didn't live okay. answer it. I'm sorry, I did type the answer though. Um, and, and to add on to it, the question was about vaping and whether or not we ask um, families of organ donors if the organ donor vaped during their lifetime and if we have been seeing damage. And um, we are just starting to see um, damage, but it's not like you would see with cigarettes where you could see black on the lungs, but we're seeing um, function, lost function. And I would uh, refer the person who asked the question to a really good Johns Hopkins article. If you Google Johns Hopkins and vaping, um, there's a lot of good information about that. Thank you so much. And then I just wanted to share a couple of facts just to put it in perspective. In the United States, there are about 108,000 people waiting transplants. And 5,000 of those come from Florida. And again, just to break it down even further, that means that one name is added every 10 minutes. And sad, but 22 people die each day waiting for organs. But the bright side is, is that one organ donor can save up to eight recipients or have the ability when it comes to hard organs. Craig mentioned the honor walk. And if you remember, my slide had a couple of pictures up including a picture of an honor walk of one of our donors from uh, uh, December of 2019. His name was Courtney Wright. He passed away at UF Health Shands Jacksonville Hospital. Um, Courtney had just joined a new church a couple of days before his death. He 
was in suffered a, a neurological injury, became an organ donor, and the members of his church came out to the hospital to give him his honor walk and, and his final farewell. Friends and family lined the corridor. We have a video on our YouTube channel and we're almost up to about 3 million views on it. It is so wonderful and it just give, kind of brings things full circle. If you have an opportunity to, to check out our YouTube channel, please do and look for his name. It's a, it's a really nice reverent send off and it perfectly encapsulates what that honor walk means. Thank you so much for your work. I have a friend who received a lung transplant, this gift of life working very well. Thank you so much. Yes, this will also be on the Health Street website for everyone to see. For the entire team here at LifeQuest, I'd like to thank Health Street and B specifically for organizing, for inviting us to make this happen for the community. We're, as Daniel said, we're here, we're LifeQuest, we're in Gainesville. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us and ask other questions. We've had some really, really good questions today about the registry, what it means to be on the registry if someone passes away in a different state. Is their registry honored and how does that work? Um, but we're, we're your OPO, we're your local program and we're here. Thank you.